name is Victor Fagans, and I am a, a junior at the University of Texas at San Antonio, a statistics major there. And today I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, parallel computing in R. So first let's talk about what is parallel computing. And to kind of address this topic, I first want to talk about what is not uh, parallel computing. So series is the alternative or sequence, sequential is kind of the, uh, the vocabulary for normal uh, that's not parallel code that's being run. Uh, think of it like people in a line, right? So have a little visual here. So say here you have your, your R computer, say you have an office and there's only one computer that runs R and Susan, uh, Bob, Carl, and Jimmy, they all have various tasks to do, right? So Susan needs to read in the data, Bob processes the data, Jimmy makes some plots, and Carl makes some models, right? So this is kind of how R code is run when you write it, right? You first thing you do is like you read in the data and this is how it runs and it runs sequentially. So in series, so each step takes, it goes one after the other, and then the time, right, adds up together for a total of 20 seconds. So there we go. That's, that's an example of series, an example of parallel, all right? So what if I told you guys we could do this? We can give an R computer, so to speak, to each person, and they can run their tasks at the same time, and that would take us five seconds. So 20 seconds down to five seconds. But... There's one issue here, and this is not a rhetorical question. What do you guys think the issue is here with this visual of them running everything at the same time? Okay, so you can do it. I know what the issue is, but I don't feel like I should say. I want to see if someone else wants to chime in. Is there an issue with what gets read first? Yes, yeah, so there's a dependency here, right? So Susan, right, like Jimmy and Carl, I think, no, this is Carl, no, wait, I don't know, Jimmy and Carl, uh, they, uh, they need to make plots and model, but they can't do that until the data is read in. So, right, so there's, there's a dependency here. So this example is not necessarily a, the best uh, situation to paralyze, right? Like maybe you could do something like this, right, where you read in the data and then you process that data and then you send it off to uh, model and make plots, right? This is maybe a bit more realistic, but not probable, right? Maybe because making plots, exploring the data might inform modeling decisions. So this type of situation, wouldn't, you wouldn't want to kind of paralyze. It's, it's kind of good as, as is, it, it, it works well in series. But so there are situations that you do want to paralyze. Right, and we call these embarrassingly parallel situations. So we have the same group of people, same workers, right? There's only one R laptop in the office, and Susan's going to model COVID spread inside of Texas and New York and Alabama and California. Each has their own assigned state where they're going to model COVID within the state, right? And each of these tasks takes 30 minutes to run, right? For a total of two times, two hours. So what do you guys think? Do you guys think this could, do they need to be, they need to do sequentially this task or do you think they could split it up and uh, do it at the same time? What do you guys think? I feel like you could probably do some parallel R in here. Yeah, right? Like if you're modeling within the state and you're not considering, right? Maybe like migration stuff. Um, you could, they, they're kind of independent of each other, right? You, the Texas COVID model is probably not going to be affected by the Alabama COVID model, right? So you're right. In fact, the supervisor came in and was like, what are you guys doing uh, waiting in line? Do it. Just go grab an R laptop and do it yourself. Their supervisor got mad at them and they're very embarrassed. Um, so, yes. So now each of them is doing their tasks at the same time. And it took, the total time it took was 40 minutes. Now, 40 minutes, each task beforehand took 30 minutes to do, right? And if they're doing it at the same time, where did that extra 10 minutes come from? Now, does anyone have any idea where that extra 10 minutes come from? It's okay, I haven't introduced it yet. You just know about, oh, ahead of time if you knew, but 
but that 10 minutes came from communication, communication costs, right? So here's a more fleshed out example of this situation, right? You have a kind of master person, right? The supervisor, and they have all the US COVID data for the entire United States. And she decides to divide the data to the workers, right? For each of the states, right? We just have four states here, but you know, it's the United States. So you in theory could have 50, right? And so they, she divides the data to the workers, the workers model the data, and then they spit back the models. So the master gets all the models back, right? And so this communication that goes on between the master and the worker nodes, that takes communication, that takes time, that takes time. And that's kind of the intuition, that's the whole process of uh, this kind of parallelization, right? You may have a task that's paralyzable or not paralyzable, um, and you might save time, but it's not perfect because of this communication, right? So it didn't take 30 minutes to complete this whole process. It took 40 minutes because of that communication cost, right? So any, any questions so far? All right, let's, uh, not at the moment. All right, so let's keep trucking along. So that's all the intuition there. That's kind of the main idea. So now how do we do this, right? How do we do this? So what makes this possible is multi-core processors, right? So you have the CPU on the computer and it runs all the calculations and code. Uh, and today, in modern day, most computers have four cores on their CPU. And, and, that, and multi-core processors were invented in 2001. So they're actually pretty new technology uh, in the grand scheme of things. And the R language was developed in 1993. That's when the R language was, came out. So when R was first being developed, paralyzed uh, multi-cores didn't exist. They didn't exist. Um, so like the R people didn't know that this was going to be a thing until later. Uh, but fortunately for us, uh, very smart people have been kind of developing uh, various techniques to implement parallelization in R. And these are where their, their libraries come in. So there's been a lot of developments in this field over recent years, right? It's parallelization is a very uh, popular thing now with like supercomputers, with like big data and like processing it faster. And so there's a lot of different packages in R that can help you implement um, parallelization in R. So the first one is just your standard parallel library, right? That's, that's something I think it's, I believe it's built into all, all of R, comes with R. Uh, but there's a lot um, in, in the R uh, world, right? R MPI, Future, For Each, and there's many more. I put a link here if you guys want to read something that the R team kind of put together. Um, and I, later I can put it in the in the chat as well. If, um, it kind of has a concise, uh, maybe a little bit too dense, um, has a list of kind of like all the packages and all the different techniques you can do to implement in R. But here we're just trying to introduce the, the concept C. So I'm going to be talking about the parallel library, which, which comes in with R. So the parallel package, what does it do? It allows, supports parallel computation, right? The splitting of information among workers to do a certain task and then make, bringing that information back. Um, there's two ways of doing this with sockets and forking. Um, what you need to know about sockets and forking is sockets are when you make a worker, right? You have to create it. It is kind of a blank slate worker and you have to kind of give it variables and packages and functions functions to kind of utilize that. Um, forking is something where each worker node is an exact copy of the master node. So they already come in with all the variables and all the packages already installed uh, and uh, that you had on um, your, your default script. So you don't have to do much work there, right? But Windows can't do forking. So don't try to do forking in Windows because it won't let you, it'll get mad at you. It'd be like, hey, I'm a Windows machine. I'm sorry, I can't help you. Um, and then also there enables random number generation, which is uh, it's not something I'm gonna be talking about today, but it's something to keep in mind 
for example, when you set a seed and you're trying to do a random number, how does that work when you're running it on multiple clusters, right? Does each have the same seed and then produce the same random numbers, right? That's something kind of a bit more advanced that I won't talk about today, but is uh, important to at least mention that it's something to consider. So let's talk about some code. So now we're in R, welcome. Uh, so let's talk about parallel library, right? So it's, I'm just gonna go over some basic functions uh, that are into this library. There's a lot uh, in there. I recommend reading the documentation if uh, after this presentation, if you wanna learn more, right? So let's talk about the first function that you probably are curious about if you're running on your computer is detect cores, right? How many cores do you have? On my computer, I have eight cores, right? And so there we go. That's the maximum number of workers I could have on my computer. And then to make workers, right? And I'm going to use the make cluster function from parallel, right? There's a lot, all different parallel packages have different ways of doing this. Make worker, make cluster, make process, make thread. Uh, there's a lot of different names for these things, but the idea, it's just essentially think of it like a worker, right? A separate worker. So I'm going to make two for this presentation because if I had eight, then the output becomes too long to hold on one slide. So here it is, make cluster. I save it into the object CL, right? And if you were going to make a fork cluster, you'd be make fork cluster. And these don't work on Windows. So if you run this on Windows, you're going to get an error. So don't do it. And then uh, if you want to stop your cluster, this is how you do it. Stop cluster CL. And it's important to, to do that uh, because then it kind of make, kind of tidies up the, the clusters. So they're not just kind of running in the wild uh, when you're, when you're not, do, not using them. So it's important to kind of shut them down when you're, you're done using them. All right. So let's talk about sending libraries to the clusters, right? So on Windows, each worker starts off as a blank slate. So they don't have any variables. They don't have any libraries loaded in. So you're going to have to kind of send that information to them, get them kind of give them set up, prepped up, ready to go, right? So you can use the cluster eval queue function. And what this function does is it just runs code that in each of the clusters that you give it. So you give it the cluster name, right? The, the object that you gave, and then in the brackets, you just run whatever code you want to do, right? So in this example, loading the tidyverse. I'm just saying every cluster load the tidyverse, right? So each cluster is going to load the tidyverse, but I could do anything in here. I could load multi other packages. I can set variables in here. Uh, anything. This is taking like a literal coding, like so. Like it's imagined you're writing this at the beginning of each of the clusters' code, and it's going to run. That's kind of how evalq works. So. Let's move on to sending functions and variables. So beforehand, that was just loading the libraries. And you can use evalq to set variables and functions too. But um, say you already have them made. Uh, and so like say I have the number two as the variable a. I have the function square that I made that just squares a function, uh, squares a number. And so then I use the cluster export function, right? I give it the cluster and then I give it a vector of the names of the various objects, right? So it's going to send in the variables, going to send the functions to the clusters, right? And then to test to see if it worked, right? Like, hey, uh, was it received? I'm going to run another eval queue. I'm going to print out A and the square of A, see if it worked. And it did. So I made two clusters before, if you remember to the first presentation, and then it prints A and then it prints the square of A. Look at that, message received. So there we go. So now let's kind of give an example of time saved, right? So here I'm gonna run something in series. It's a pretty, just a little toy example, um, right? I'm running system.sleep3. So that just means it makes the computer wait three seconds before doing anything. And if I run this in a for loop, this is gonna run five times. And then I'm going to count how long that took, right? So 15 seconds, which makes sense. Five times three is uh, 15. So that's, that was running in series. Now, if I run a similar thing in parallel, so this I'm going to be using the par s apply function or the l. There's also a par l apply, cluster apply. There's a lot of different functions you can use to kind of do a for loop type structure in parallel. I recommend looking through documentation to kind of see what, what's out there for your, for your needs. 
Um, but in this example, I'm just going to do the same exact thing that I did in the previous example, where I run system sleep three, uh, five times. So I just wrote this vector here. That's just three, the number three written five times. So that's the function system that sleep gets that three, uh, for five times, but you can see here that it only took nine seconds to run instead of 15. And that was because they had two nodes working at it at the same time. And that's where that time save comes in. So then I'm done with this slide and this little toy example. So I'm gonna stop the cluster. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna call it a day. And there you go. So now let's look at a real example, right? So I just showed you some toy example, right? With a for loop and system.sleep. But now let me, uh, let me open up uh, my R studio here. And let me make sure, let me reshare my screen. All right, so let's, let's make this a bit bigger. And uh, how do I zoom in? Do you know, <laughs> Henry, what the yeah, it's, it's It's control plus. Control plus, control plus. And it's not working for me, but oh. let me see huh. here. Uh, D profile tools. View, zoom in, control plus plus. No, that didn't work. Uh, yeah, it's, if you have a plus, okay, so it works on the number pad if you do control plus. Oh, Josh says does. control scroll. Okay, there you go. Yeah, control scroll doesn't work, Josh, sorry. Um, but let's look at this script I wrote. So this script, right, so the, the kind of motivation behind this script is that my boss, my hypothetical boss, he owns a mapping magazine and he wants to make a bunch of different plots for all the counties in Texas. He, and that's like, uh, like hundreds, hundred plots. Uh, I think it's in like around 200 uh, plots and he wants it to be mapped to risk factors. He wants to have showcase risk factors in the different counties in Texas, how many individuals have risk factors, right? So I'm gonna load in the packages, I'm gonna read in the data, I'm gonna filter, I'm gonna get the geography, right? All this is like data processing stuff, right? I'm just getting all my data set up, right? You don't need to understand it. Um, you just gotta get the idea that I'm making this map, right? So let's, uh, let's, let's run this and see what that looks like when it's done. And then, uh, Actually, I'm just going to run the whole thing while, and then I'll talk while it's running. That makes more sense. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm going to make a function called Texas County Map. And what that function does is it takes a county name. So like, say, for example, Bear County, where San Antonio is. And it's going to map that county with the variables from uh, ch -ch -ch -ch, uh this number, which is the uh, predicted rate of individuals who have risk factors. So risk factors are just like poverty, sickness, health, things like that. For example, maybe this would be important if you wanted to say vaccinate, send COVID vaccines to high risk areas, right? So you may want to know where that is. Um, so now let's, so here it is. There, let me, uh, I'm just going to run the whole thing. So here it is plotting in series. So what this is doing is that I create a list of all the unique counties in Texas. So now I have a list of all the unique counties and I'm gonna create a function that saves the map. So my boss needs it all in a magazine. So he wants me to make a bunch of JPEGs and send them off, right? And they all need to be the same format and things like that. So I make, a, I use this code to save the, county maps. So here I say Texas county map name, right? Where it takes the name of the, from the Texas counties eventually. And I'm going to say what folder to save it in, right? So now here it is when I run it in series, right? So I'll apply Texas county save map folders equals plots, right? So save map is the function and it's going to save it for every single name, right? I'll apply it. You apply a function to a list. That's kind of how I'll apply works. And it's going to do that in series for every item one after the other. Right, and then for plotting in parallel, right? So here I'm using, I'm loading the parallel library. I'm gonna make eight clusters, eight nodes, and then I'm gonna send in the variables I need, right? So Texas County Map and Texas GeoCRE, which is my data. And this is the function that uh, makes the map. 
And then I'm going to cluster eval queue. I'm going to load in the various uh, libraries that it needs to operate. And then I'm going to do par l apply. So you see the difference between when I did l apply uh, from here. I, to make a parallel in the parallel library, I just added a par and a capital L. And it's par l apply. I give it the cluster. I give it my cluster name or the names of the variables I want it to iterate over. Uh, I give it the function and I give it the function variable. And that takes, you know, that's quicker. So let me see if I can figure out how it ran. Let's see here. Um, I may have got an error here. So it's one of those things when you do things live, uh, there could be problems. So give me a second here to uh, zoom out a bit. All right, so what happened here? I'm just gonna run the part I know that works. So, uh, boop. What happened here? Could not find, I'm sorry guys. This is working last night and we'll have to see it. Uh, see here what's going on environment all right so this also is. happens every time i try to do something live too <laughs> yeah so here it is l apply so this is going to be the series all right so it's going to run the tech uh, for every single texas county it's going to save the map of it and the folder plots so let me i'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second and share the screen in general so that I can show you kind of where it is saving these things. Uh, playing with R, parallel. So I have two folders here, plots and plots par, and it's gonna be saving all the plots into this folder. So you can see here, it's kind of already done some of them. Right, and it's gonna updating them a bit too as it reruns, uh, because this, these are left over from the night before. And then now, see, it's exploring the cluster it's evaluating the libraries now. So it's setting in all the appropriate libraries it needs for the code to run. And uh, one thing that I would say to be very, it's very tedious about is uh, it's kind of hard to tell what exactly your clusters need if you're, if you're kind of using a function that relies on different functions. So I just recommend giving it all the libraries and play it safe. Cause I was trying to be like mince perfect. Like, oh, it doesn't need that library. It doesn't need that library. But so I just gave it all of it. So there you go, it ran. And you can see here, the parallel took 17 seconds to run. And then I ran, I subtracted the series in parallel and I saved 30 seconds from, from when it ran from series versus parallel. And the only difference here is that the parallel, right? I made eight nodes, I ran parallel apply, I exported the variables here and there you go. And you notice here that I started the timer when I started to make the clusters, because that's important. Making the clusters, sending the libraries, sending the variables, that's in that communication time, right? It is an important to, to uh, kind of measure that. If I just put the start the timer where it was actually just doing the function, which in fact I did on accident, uh, <laughs> uh, then it would be kind of biased. Um, but there you go. The idea is that it saves time. So any questions? I know it's kind of got a little hectic there when I got into the code. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wanted to um, ask a couple quick questions. So this, I thought this was really good. And I, I never actually used the, um, the cluster argument, the make cluster argument before, or any of the, the cluster export or cluster eval. So that's that's sending those libraries and that data to your clusters yes okay and do you know is that sending them to to all of them like so all of them have to have a copy of that environment like they all have to have those libraries loaded and and all of that data yeah so the way i did this every single node which i have eight of them gets a copy of the function I made and the data I made um, and then all the libraries. So 
there could be a way to kind of isolate, like only these clusters get this information and this clusters get this information. Uh, but in this example, since they're all doing the same exact task, uh, they are getting kind of the same information, right? The only thing that they're getting separately is when this par L apply runs, it's gonna split the Texas County data, which I can show you what that is. It's just a name of each of the counties. So the only thing that each cluster is gonna get differently is the, the names of the counties. So it's gonna be like, okay, cluster uh, one is gonna get one through 10, cluster two, 10 through whatever, uh, things like that. That's kind of how the par L apply is. So the only difference in this example from the clusters is what county names they get, but everything else, the setup, the function, the data, they all begin with it. So, okay, cool. And you may consider maybe instead of, so this data contains all the cluster, all the counting information um, and uh, right, maybe I should have just sent requests, sent the information that each cluster needed. So, right, it doesn't need the entire data set. It just needs the ones for their county, hmm. right? Which is something that I could pre-allocate, um, but then you might get, it might consider into like communication time. If I'm sending in like, say a bunch of tiny data frames to, to each cluster for just based on the county name, but if I just send in in the beginning, you're all going to get the big one, and then you're just going to filter it on your own. That might end up being faster, um, depending on sending, you know, based on the need. Um, so those are the, these, those are just kind of some of the nuances uh, to it. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, it's an interesting issue because it it you talked about this like there's a certain point of diminishing returns. Yeah, with so you can see here plots par here it all saved well no uh, no maps we can see wise county here with their risk let's look at bear county since it's probably what at least some of us are familiar with bear county jpeg you can see here here's uh the yes. texas uh, bear county you can hear this the center san antonio with uh, percent of people with three plus risk factors right? It's downtown uh, high poverty rates things like that cause uh cause can cause problems right so if there's going to be a vaccine drive maybe th those are the places to host it because those are the people where that risk versus say here up in the the north where there's not that many people with a lot of risk factors so there you go and now my boss has every single map of all the counties and now he can i can zip up this file and send it to him for whatever he wants right my hypothetical boss so there you go uh but yeah, that's my end of my presentation. Uh, thank you for coming. <laughs> and um, I, had a, I had a hard time coming up with examples. So it's really something that you have to kind of think of up on your own because you know, no one knows the types of coding problems you have uh, except yourself. Uh, so you got to really, uh, that's why I really focused on the intuition so that you can start taking care of your problems with Parallel versus kind of me just showing you like, here's all the things you can do in parallel. And then you thinking like, oh, none of that works for me. And then thinking, oh, parallel isn't good for me. Uh, thinking like that. So there you go. There you go. Very nice. Very good work. Yay. All right. <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to ask one question real quick. Um, yeah, go ahead. So you mentioned that there is a lot of overhead with, and I think I was, maybe you didn't use that term, but I think that's, that's a commonly used term for the phenomenon you're describing where um, sometimes parallel is not 100% efficient. In fact, it's pretty much never 100% efficient, but it can be varying degrees of inefficient. And um, I was wondering if you could get to a point where in a weird way, doing it in parallel could actually be less efficient than doing it in serial. Um, yeah, definitely. That's like if you're so the the rule of thumb uh, with it is if your if your nodes are doing something really fast and like there's not a lot of processing going on, um, then yeah, generally you don't want to do a lot of fast tasks. You want to do a few big tasks. So the more that you can organize your workers to to kind of do like here's the thing I need you to do, then that's better. So if, like, for example, in our, in the Canva presentation, right, say, 
uh, like in this example, like each one of these tasks is really fast, right? So you maybe wouldn't want to uh, paralyze this even though, because it's really fast anyway, right? 20 seconds and then you're saving what, uh, if this if this worked 100% well, right? Five, 10, uh, and then say 15 seconds, but then this process of communication took like two seconds, then you're saving only like, you know, a couple seconds. So this maybe is not a situation. This would be an example of serious good. But when you have a situation like this, where say, you know, each one takes 30 minutes to run, and then it in total takes two hours. And then, you know, you got the super, supervisor get mad at you, and then now you're saving a lot more time, right? Two hours of 40 mm -hmm. minutes. And so then that overhead of 10 minutes doesn't look that much. And then if you kind of, kind of, uh, if you want to extrapolate to all 50 states, right? You know, do the math. So it's say 30 times 50 is uh, divided by 60. It's 25 hours to do all the, all the states. And then if you, you know, if you do them all at the same time, right? Say you had 50 nodes, and then that had like, say 20 minutes overhead plus 30, that's 50 minutes from 25 hours to 50 minutes, then that's a lot of time saved. So it's, it's particularly, it's, it's best when you have a situation like this, where you have kind of a lot of tasks that are taking a long time and that they're independent from each other. That's like the ideal situation. And the overhead is kind of minuscule uh, when at this level, right? When it comes to the, the big tasks and this is scalable that's kind of the one thing with parallel is that it's scalable right when series you know it's it's if you're depending on what you're doing you can you know it can not get scalable quick like just doing one state 30 minutes okay cool doing two states an hour oh okay, cool 50 states 25 hours or maybe like every country in the world uh you know that might take a while so hopefully that so victor um yes, just a quick ahead. question do you yep. find that it's best used then in a multi-user computer system versus like on your own local computer? From what I can tell, um, the difference between like say, so so like Christian is talking about something I didn't talk about in my presentation, which is that, so in my uh, presentation, I kind of just focused on working on, on your individual computer, which most of you will be, will be doing, right? Uh, not many of us have access to a uh, supercomputer uh, somewhere to 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 kind of run our analysis on right where it's kind of we're, you're connecting your personal computer to some server right and it has distributed computing there though Henry does have that set up so maybe we all do have access to it um, but um, but the from what I can tell from reading and my research is that it's the same intuition and it's the same kind of overhead and that there isn't necessarily like I haven't read I haven't read anywhere definitively where it's like if you're on the same computer then it's it's good um, then uh, but uh, I can think of an example when I was running it in Python and I was running it on one machine and what I was doing on that machine was reading in files and processing the files and then merging them together and for that to work, I needed all my nodes to know where that file was. And so it needed access to my hard drive. And so when, if I was in a distributed computer network where the memory wasn't, like the actual hard drive wasn't shared, then I would need to have sent that information out uh, beforehand. So, I, and that would probably be a lot of overhead. Like it's, the files are very large, so. Um, there's pros and cons, depending on what you're doing. If you're just doing like say mathematics stuff, like just you're doing some processing and numbers, um, then it might be it might be no difference. But if you're accessing like shared memory, like actual hard drive, then um, there's gonna be more overhead when it comes to distributed machine versus um, your personal, just one user and then you're using multiple cores. So. Makes sense. Yeah, it's all, it's all about the overhead though. And, um, down to it, it just, you have to do it and then measure it and then you know. Uh, there's, uh, there's like some t intuition goes into it, but at the end of the day, you measure it and then you know. And then you see like, oh, series was faster. And then you know, okay, for this for this particular bit, uh, I'm just gonna run it in series. Or hey, like uh, R has different packages you can do to measure, measure things. And so you can kind of see what the hangup is in code and stuff like that, so. 
um, yeah, then there we go. I was actually gonna, I was going to um, bring up like when you're on like cluster, like our high performance computer. Um, and this is something that I think about honestly all the time because parallel computing, once you start doing any, any sort of serious bioinformatics in like a Linux environment on, on like a high performance computer, you have to think about parallel computing all the time um, because it's what you're mostly going to be doing. Um, and one of the things you have to think about is the fact that there's diminishing returns for every parallel task you want to run. And it, it's an interaction between the software, which is the actual program that is being parallelized, right? So some programs can only be so parallelized before they stop being better. There's like a diminishing returns point. And most authors of most programs will try to find that point and tell you what it is. Um, but there's also diminishing returns because of your actual hardware. And this is what Victor was talking about. If you have to read and write to a hard drive, like a spinning disk that can only read and write so fast, then if you've got a hundred cores that are trying to write a file all at the same time, your, your speed is actually going to drop dramatically on the whole server which will very much annoy all the other people who are working on it, as I have learned from personal experience. Um, so there's just so many things you have to consider. And in particular, if you're doing anything that's like reading and writing to disk, um, like that's, that's where the calculation has to become like a little bit more. You have to think it through a little bit more, I think. But yeah, yeah um, I thought that was a great example though, Victor. Thank you. And, uh, that, that kind of operations there, you'll, you'll often see them at as like uh, I slash O or like input output um, operations. And um, so for the example that I did, my real life example in R where I was saving all those maps, I was making a map for all the uh, different counties and saving it. Um, the input output operation, uh, that type of task, that's something you may want to consider like, cause I'm saving, saving it. so. That's something to consider your hard wife, hardware. I don't have a hard drive. I have a SSD. And so it's possible that if I had a physical disk to writing to, then that, that how data is written is in serial on, on a hard drive. And so then that, 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 that example wouldn't have worked. Um, but because I had an SSD, it, it may have worked or it made it because the, the plots themselves, there was a lot of more processing in the making of the plot versus the file size itself was pretty small. So that the, the plot, the actual making of the plot had was where the time was taking versus the actual just saving of it. Um, so that's something to, to keep in mind. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's the funny thing about like, so when I was setting up my server, um, that was the thing I thought about most was exactly this issue. Because on, on my school's computer, which is, it's got 192 cores, you can do some really parallelized stuff on it. But it almost doesn't matter most of the time, because it's, it's running a spinning disk hard drive. So <laughs> in bioinformatics, most of what we do is going to be reading to and writing from, or re reading from and writing to disk. And so it's almost like, sure, I can complete the analysis four times faster, but then I wait for an hour for it to write all the data to the disk. So it doesn't, like all my gains can be immediately wiped out. Um, and that's why I set up my server the way I did, because even though it's got a quarter the size in terms of cores, it's still a lot faster because of the speed with which you can read and write, uh, you know, the IO speed, I guess you could say, and the speed at which the memory and the CPU can communicate. So sometimes parallel isn't the answer, right? Like sometimes there's other bottlenecks in your system, which I just think the whole thing is so interesting to consider. So I really, I really have appreciated that you brought up that issue. Because um, it's something that people, I think, overlook a lot when we first talk about parallel, those bottleneck problems. Yeah, at the end of the day, you run it and then you measure it. Uh, that's, the, that's the true test. So, yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm a bit curious. So which uh, workload manager are you using for your server? So, so uh, Victor, I don't think brought this up, um, but you can you can do different things like you can do Slurm and, and there's all sorts of things you can use to manage clusters. 
Uh, I don't do any of that. I just run a, a vanilla Ubuntu server because um, you don't you don't really need any of that unless you're running um, a series of like nodes or something like that. If you're running like a distributed computing network that Victor talked about. Yeah, because uh, because yeah, what Victor explained was very reminiscent of actually what I have been doing, but uh, I do it differently. Like I make it. Uh, R scripts and bash scripts and then just iterate over them by using SLR. And I think that it's the same concept, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a, uh, I wouldn't say I'm trained computer uh, parallel person. I just read a bunch of articles online and watched some YouTube videos and uh, got the, got the intuition. So there's, I'm, there's a lot more nuance in there and, I didn't cover at all anything about managing, actually managing the clusters or anything to sending like special particular things to special individual clusters. Um, it was very much, the goal was the intuition, the idea the, so that you guys can now explore and learn and look into it. Yeah, but, but it was also very nice uh, to look at it in the context of R because I didn't actually know about it. So actually what you said was that when I when I don't uh, make clusters and I don't, for example, use the parallel uh, library, then whenever I run a for loop, then uh, it's always in a series and always one core is being used. Yeah, a lot of the R documentation is for that kind of impl implementation is with the for loop because for loops are generally very independent, uh, at least in my experience. So there, a lot of them, like the for each package, is basically just a for loop. Uh, and then you can you can register whatever back backend uh, parallel computing you want. Um, that's one of the benefits. I didn't go into the other special packages. Um, I just went over the basic, so parallel package and, and and when you use so um there is a there is a concept called vectorization r and i've been working on on a project and for example when i ran the for loop it took 30 minutes I, i'm sorry 30 seconds but then when i used vectorization it took less than uh, five seconds i wanted to see if when i use vectorization is it is still using one core or is it uh, using multiple cores by default or how is it uh, faster, if you have an idea? When um, vectorization, when you say that, and I think of the process of parallel computing, the example I think of is say you have a vector, right? You think of like, uh, say vector addition, right? Let me, uh, right, where you're, say you're, you're adding something, um, boop, boop. Boop, boop, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And you're adding, say, row wise, uh, you can do that independent. So you, what some people do is when they have this, they'll just send each one to a worker and then the, and the information will come back and then you'll combine them all into your answer. Um, I don't know if that has to do anything with your question, but that's what makes, that's the first thought of when I came up is when you have say like a matrix or a series of vectors, you can, whenever a lot of vector operations are paralyzable because, you know, column, row wise, things like that. Yeah, cool, thanks. So. This is this is a real, you actually brought up uh, a really great issue that's actually different from, from parallel, right? So parallel is is all about taking your tasks, like Victor said, and, and splitting them across different cores or different workers. Um, uh, vectorizations actually in the software itself finding a more efficient way to complete a task um, by taking advantage of vector structures and that's actually something that I'll admit I don't even really understand super well how R does it but like for example um, all of the functions in the tidyverse are pretty much all vectorized so if you use some, if you use a tidyverse version of some function, typically it's much more efficient than having written something like a for loop, um, if that makes sense. But it, the the way that that works is down at the level of like the C plus plus code that it's based on, and I really have no idea how it works personally. But it would be actually really interesting to have a lecture on how vectorization is working in R. 
So it's a good question. I but I personally don't know. Well, that's that's going to be a very tough question, I think, because yeah, I also tried to dig into it, but uh, yeah, as as soon as it gets into C plus plus, then I I lose. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I was uh, watching in part of preparing for this pre presentation. I watched some lectures uh, from from people who do who, who talk about parallelization. And one of the presentations, it went by like, hey, so it was like a kind of comedic approach. They talked about like all the things you can do in series to make your code run better, like vectorize, ideal bit mapping, and, you know, all the different computer science things. Um, and then uh, and then he said, like, and it still runs slow. Uh, and so now you use parallel. Um, so there, there you go. There might be situations where, um, according to the, the presentation I saw, that like even if you, even if you optimize everything completely and minimize data and you vectorize everything, if your task is large enough, then you can do that and parallelize. So, for sure. Were there any other questions for Victor? Okay, well, really fantastic work. Uh Thank you so much for presenting on that. That was that was Mike really has a, really helpful. Mike has a question. Oh, Mike. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's rather basic, and I just wanted to know whether um, the things I usually do on the server, and I don't know whether you term them as parallel. So an example is a uh, given you running uh, a script, and you have two different data sets that you're handling independently. But then the same script handles the same uh, the two data sets. Um, so you submit that script for data set one, and then the same script for data set two. Will you term that uh, part of it? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. If um, if the data sets are uh, if the script's taking a long time, like for example, let's give it let's give a let's give a story to this. I love stories. So say you're you're working at a company, and there's a there's a, a daily report that comes out. And then each week you have to analyze each daily report and create a weekly report. Um, so when, um, so think of that each daily report as like a new data set and you're analyzing each day the same way. And then at the end, you're just combining it all to make your weekly reports. Um, and so you have that script and what your iterator would be is either the like say file location of the data or maybe uh, you already read in all the data beforehand and now you just have it like as a variable, like this data set, this data set. And then you can do a simple like that parallel apply and say apply this function and it could be as complex as you want to this data set and then combine the result afterwards. So depending on the situation, yeah, um, that, that's, that's something that you would do. Like in my example, the different data sets. I had one big data set, and then I had each cluster filter that data set based off their uh, need for data. But another way I could have done it was say I had multiple data sets for say I had a, a folder with each county data set. I could have just read in each one of those to a different cluster. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's an example where that, that would be, you could parallelize that. Um, but in the nice. ultimately to see if you would save time is you would measure it. <laughs> Makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, really great work, Victor. Okay. Um, give some virtual round of applause here. There we go. All right.